How can God use humanitarian aid in the midst of a war crisis to bring hope and healing to the land of Israel? Hi, and welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and today we're talking with Joel and Lynn Rosenberg from Jerusalem to answer those very questions about how God can use humanitarian aid to bring healing in this time of crisis. Joel, Lynn, welcome to this episode of Inside the Epicenter. It's so great to see you guys both on this podcast. Thank you, Carl. We're, we're happy to be able to do anything together these days because so much is happening. It's, yeah. And uh, we find ourselves like I'm doing the information side, talking to the New York Times, Fox News, whatever, you know, all these interviews. And she's often on the road meeting with uh, with our partners, encouraging people that are struggling, delivering relief. So yeah. Yeah, it's nice to be <laughs> doing something together right now. Nice to have you, Lynn. It's such a blessing. I'm telling you, uh, I get to talk to your husband a lot, as you know, and I don't get as much opportunity <laughs> to speak with you, but it's so good to have you on. Lynn, okay. m- maybe you could just give us a little bit of what you've been experiencing. Um, I know that you've been volunteering with some of our humanitarian aid teams throughout the country of Israel. You know, we're hearing, uh, of course, all the news reports and and all of those things. Tell me some of the things that you've been doing alongside our teams uh, for humanitarian aid. Sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just been an intense week of trying to figure out who needs help and who are the people we're able to help? You know, that's a big thing in these kinds of crises. You know, there's not there's things we're not good at and there's things we're good at and figuring out what that is. Mm-hmm. So that's been wonderful because um, we've been able to bring a lot of supplies. One of the things that we know is is vendors and ordering things wholesale. So we've been able to get some of the things that both displaced families and also people who are, are at home, but they're afraid they're afraid single moms in some cases who are living in bomb shelters because you know if you imagine if you're living in one of these border communities and you've got a baby you're not going to run to the bomb shelter you know most places down there don't have a bomb shelter right in their home Hmm. so they're running to a community bomb shelter so you're not going to do that in your pajamas five six seven eight times a night with a baby and little toddlers Hmm. and so basically these families these moms move into the bomb shelters So they're just there all through the night um, and often through the day because it's been just round the clock, nonstop. And they're really, they're scared, they're traumatized. So we've been bringing water. Water is one of the things that's been lacking in the shelves, you know, and so we're able to order wholesale, just cases and cases of water, bottled water, bringing that to the bomb shelters, bringing that to people who are, you know, moving into hotels, for instance, or moving into, um, friends' apartments that don't live in the country and are offering them, you know, everyone's sort of scrambling to get out of the South. Mm -hmm. And then we've been going down to the South as well, bringing Mm -hmm. things to them in the bomb shelters. So we've been to Beersheba and uh, bringing toys, bringing children's clothes. Sometimes they've run to these shelters without clothes. I mean, without more than what they've got on their backs. So Tell tell us a story of one of those distributions. Like, what was it like to actually hand some of that material, some of those needed things to people who are in such desperate need? Well, just getting there was was exciting, uh, too exciting. Um, too you know, exciting. We, you know, we all have on our phones these apps that are tracking where um, the red alerts are going off. So you can set it for your own location. Or you can set it for even if that location is changing. So while you're on the road, it's it's going to follow you and basically go off if you've got mm-hmm. um, alerts happening. I'm going to show you right now. Um, wow. You I can see see that's the latest set of attacks all right around now. Tel Aviv in the south. And you just wow. and if you set it, we, we set it for the whole country. So we see what everything's happening. But you might just set it for your town or wow. wherever you're driving to. And the sirens go off, the thing starts buzzing, whatever. It's uh, anyway, so continue. Yeah. So, yeah, we've got it set for the whole country because, you know, we've got 20 distribution centers with the Joshua Fund, 20 plus, mm-hmm. really. Um, and so we want to know where our partners are and if they're in danger, just so we can be praying for them. But also because we're driving to them. So we're trying to see when are those windows of time that you can drive. 
So three of us were driving. We've had wonderful volunteers that have been coming with us, um, loaded up the car and drove. And, you know, you can see on the map, okay, the alert is going off about 20 minutes ahead of us. So you sort of slow down and you think, okay, now it stopped. You keep going. Mm -hmm. There's military uh, police, there's roadblocks. When we got to Beersheba the other day, it was like a ghost town. There was no one out on the streets. Wow. Um, That's a big city. It's a big city. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, we were only in one section of it. So maybe there were people more by the stores or the, I don't know, but where we were was quiet, just wow. very, very, very quiet. Yeah. We pulled up to the place where this one young woman just came out. Honestly, we'd been told that she spoke Hebrew, but not good English. But when we started speaking to her in Hebrew and we had brought along, you know, someone very fluent in Hebrew, she was just unable to, to speak, to understand. She was so, it's very hard to, she was just in shock, I think. Um, mm. And then she said, she said, Anglit, Anglit, you know, English. So we're like, oh, okay. So we thought, oh, maybe she's a Russian speaker, but she speaks English. So then we switched to English. Yeah. She couldn't understand or communicate in English. Wow. So, um, so anyway, we had a friend that we could call that could speak to her in Russian, but, but it, she was too nervous to even do that. And we mm. were feeling like we better get out of here also. Mm. We basically, she, she wanted to take the stuff and run back into the mm. shelter. Mm. Wow. So we hugged her. She was teary. She was shaky. Um, we prayed and we got out of there. So, well, so talk about the story of um, just a part of our team last night going down right near where the massacre of 260 young people yeah. have been gunned down at a music festival. So just tragic. that whole thing. Um, can you share just a little bit of what, what that team experienced on the Joshua Fund team? Yeah. So there are, of course, believers that have all gotten called up into these units, sure. into these army units, 360,000, I think is the latest number of reservists, right? Of total got, reservists, total right. That mm -hmm. got called up. So of course, within that number are many, many believers. So we've been getting messages. I mean, from half the half the men in our congregation uh, are are called up. Called like up our own TV. staff member, we just hired a chief of staff for Atlanta Media because there was so much mm -hmm. going on. He got called up. The mm -hmm. top, all the top management, and most of the staff, half the staff of my TV show, my, my own producer. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah. back to you. I mean, it's like. Everybody it's, we know almost. It's a full mobilization. Yeah. It's a right. full mobilization. Biggest mobilization, I think, since the, the first war. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, among those soldiers are many, many believers. And so we're getting word from some of these believers that they've arrived to their rendezvous places where all their units are mobilizing and that they don't have some basic supplies even like toiletries, hygiene products, toilet paper, mattresses to sleep on. Water purification uh, kits and uh, right, right. headlamps. So, uh, so when some of those men and women give us a call, we're able to go to them. So three of our people went yesterday to four different locations along that southern mm -hmm. Gaza border. They, their plan was to go to the closest city to the border first, sort of get the most dangerous thing out of the way and then work their way out. Yeah. But then the ways and the GPS is very jammed down there. There's just oh. a lot of there's a lot of strange things happening, a lot yeah. of yeah. a lot of cyber attacks, a yeah. lot of. So their GPS wasn't even working at all. So mm. it turned out that the fourth stop was actually the closest one. Mm. So they had to. So they thought, well, we told him this guy that we're coming with this with all these supplies. So yeah. They started that direction. They got very close to where they were going to meet him. And then he called and said, there's a threat in the area. You guys need to turn around and get out of here quickly. Now, their alarms weren't going off, so they're not sure what the threat was. Right. But he he's an intelligence, he's an intelligence so in he, that unit. Yeah. So that was really scary because you don't wow. rockets are one thing. But if there's still men, terror, gunmen on the loose in an area. So they turned around very quickly and got out of there and waited at a gas station until he gave them the all clear. Wow. They turned back around and went again <sighs> and they got there just as a huge um, battalion of of um, of like special forces units were going out. And wow. so they <laughs> these Commander wanted to know what you're doing here. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> they don't want to see civilians. They don't They're know like, who are you. Yeah. Yeah. But but when they explained who they were and what they were doing, he was yeah. so. These people are so moved. They're so touched yes. that 
that people are coming, uh, that people Christians love them, that Christians are praying for them, that they care about them. They said one of the people that was there yesterday had just arrived from Florida, a Christian woman from Florida. And yeah. they said, she said, I just came here from Florida. And he, this guy gave her a big hug and said, I can't believe that you would have come into this into the country when everyone's leaving yeah. and she said so many people love you so many people in america are praying for you yes. there's christians all over the world and he was so mm. moved so moved so this believer in his unit is now going to be able to say this is this is what followers of jesus do this is wow. who they are so it's really really been wow. special and well, if that weren't dramatic enough yeah while they were driving to one of these places and night had fallen so now you're in darkness they're seeing rocket attacks like like Lighting on up the sky. IMAX screen in front of them. Like they're watching rockets go up from Gaza, which they're very close to, and they're seeing the Iron Dome interceptors and the you know the contrails and the light and the the, the flames blowing up in front. Like it's <laughs> and this woman had been our two staff had picked her up from the she was the only American and I'm sure the only believer on the entire LL flight in yeah. seven duffel bags filled with, uh, you know, like supplies. 250 pounds of supplies. Wow. That she, anyway, all that to say, they picked her up from the airport and you know, jet lag, the whole thing. She's like, no, no, if you guys need to go, let's go. And let's so go. she was part of this thing. Wow. Unbelievable what they're well, getting to see, but what the courage, the risks that they're taking to show the love of Jesus. Like yeah. normally we show the love of Jesus and it's not a risk unless somebody, you know, doesn't like us or, you know, yeah. spit on us or whatever. But this right. is, uh, you know, they didn't get an armored car. Nope. Like I no did when I went to Stroh. They didn't there get, no you know, an yeah. armed detail of people yeah. with automatic weapons. They, this is them well, uh, in normal cars. And, uh, well, both and, both of you guys as well, you know, I'm just I'm just so moved and, and touched that you guys would would risk uh, safety uh, in order to go and, and, uh, and take care and bless those that need it. I, I will say, you know, it's not it's not the Joshua Fund's recommendation that you jump on a plane and bring no. duffel bags <laughs> yourself. There's lots of other ways. People are asking stuff, us all the yeah. time, how can I help? How can I help? Well, we we right. know how you can help uh, best. And it's to uh, to provide the resources to the Joshua Fund so that people can can give we can give our partners, we can give our local congregation leaders, we can give our pastors um, uh, the encouragement, the support and Frankly, those that are serving in in the IDF, that we can we can make sure that they have what they need in this yeah. moment and this crisis time. So, and I, also, and of course, we're also helping Palestinian churches, of course, pa yes. Palestinian pastors. It's like it's not one sided. I know that some people will listen to this and and oh. they'll be upset. They'll say you're helping the IDF. Listen, no, we're not. You know, these no are more. these are people that are defending their homeland against yeah. ISIS butchers slaughtering yeah. cutting heads yeah. uh, babies off like it, it, so yes we are doing that and we mm -hmm. are honored to do it but we're also leaning in and helping palestinian believers to help their neighbors that's right it's not it's not a one-sided thing that's right um but it's it, it's essential i will say to summarize what you said about how people can help learn pray give mm -hmm. Don't go. Don't go right now. <laughs> not asking anybody to go, like right now. Like, this yeah. particular woman has a daughter who's married to an Israeli. Well, She's coming go. anyway. Yeah. So yeah. This yeah. Is and not again, a this is not situation. this is not to <laughs> right. criticize. Right. But it's to just right. say that uh, for average people here listening, what can we do? How can we help? Well, the Joshua Fund's rapid response uh, fund, which uh, God is uh, God is blessing. We've had we've had over well almost fifteen hundred new donors uh, since we deployed mm -hmm. this. We've had. Uh, you know, and, and when the when the numbers are, are tallied, it, they're still coming in. But we've had hundred people making gifts of uh, everything from five dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars to support the work of uh, of the humanitarian aid that the Joshua Fund is doing. And I just want to say, you know, to anybody listening to Joel and Lynn right now, you are you are really fulfilling the 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 promise that Jesus wants us to, to stand with our brothers and sisters, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, Joel and Lynn, you and the, as the volunteers and our staff that are there, they, you know, when we can fill your hands with the food, the clothing, the bedding, the, the headlamps, the, the, the toys, the diapers, uh, we are actually being uh, a fulfillment of Jesus's call on our lives to, yeah. to bless those that need it. 
It's right out of, I mean, we've said this for 17 years, but it's never more true than this week and the last few weeks. We talk about Matthew 24, Jesus warns there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, yeah. all kinds of horrors. Yes. Yeah. Matthew 25, he's saying, you know, he's, re he's, he's rewarding the people that gave food when he was hungry and mm -hmm. water when he was thirsty and, and, and comfort and, you know, and aid. And, and they're like, when did we see you? Like, when did we help mm -hmm. you personally, Jesus? And he's like, well, if you did this for the least of my brothers, you did this for me. This is one of those moments where, you know, I, look, I know people, I'm getting messages from people like, can I sign up and join the IDF and help? No, you can't. Don't do that. Can I get on a plane? Like, I, I, yeah, we don't want that story to make people go, uh, you have your phone start ringing off the hook. I'm in. <laughs> like, me let me go. Plane. Let's charter no. a plane. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no. the reason she was the only believer, or only American on that plane is because everyone else was an Israeli coming home to stand yeah. with their country. Yeah. But learning and praying and giving, look, look the, the, the needs are coming in so fast and so furious that no matter what is coming in and praise God, I know that he is mm -hmm. moving people's hearts to help, mm -hmm. but the money's going to go right out the door mm -hmm. because the needs are just mounting. So Can I'm I very say, encouraged. I think I, I want to say that the, the needs are going to be long term as well, yes, because we're right. already seeing that's right, there's right. going to be needs for trauma counseling yes. for mothers and fathers and children who've gone through just unimaginable things. Yes. We've already started organizing yeah, calls. Um, one of one of our partners, um, they are biblical counselors, and we've been doing Zoom calls in Hebrew and in English for different, mm -hmm. um, for moms and dads, how to parent in a time of crisis mm -hmm. and anxiety. How do I care for my child? How do I make sure I'm okay so that I can care for my community? So there's going to be things. Um, just tonight, I was in a, in a location where uh, 80 families have gotten resettled uh, huh. from, from, those Southern places, mm -hmm. they came out of such, mm -hmm. such horror. It's like they walked out of a nightmare, but those nightmares, they follow them. And, yeah. um, we're, we're, we're providing food for them and everything from, you know, clothes because where they came from to where they went is a different climate. So they mm -hmm. need sweaters. Like it's just an enormous, enormous. an enormous task. Well, yeah. the Joshua Fund again is so grateful to you guys. You 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 are the founders of the Joshua Fund, so this is your baby, if you will, and uh, and your baby is doing good work around the region. Um, well, it's grown up; it's seventeen years old now, and it's, yeah, uh, you know, it's a young adult, and it's got a lot of experience. <laughs> Hebrew speakers, people That's who right. know the country and they know the cultures, right. they've got trusted, vetted. Yes. You know, we know because it's not one of the thing, Carl, it's not just that we we're telling you examples, Lynn, especially telling you examples of us personally delivering. But one of the things that I'm excited about and I want to share with our podcast audience is we never were built to to do all the work ourselves. We're the Joshua Fund. Mm -hmm. So some of this is that we have trusted partners who have a lot of logistical experience. They have a lot of volunteers. Everybody that didn't go to the front is like, what do I do? And they're like, great. So there's a there's a place in Israel, for, several, but like one I'm thinking specifically, and they're just, we're buying the food and the supplies in bulk because we drive the price down. If you just go, some of them were just going to the supermarket or to the, you know, whatever the store that they need. And they're paying three times as much, right? So that dollar or that shekel is, is, is only not, is not going far enough. But we, by buying in much larger quantities, we get the lowest possible prices then we can provide that and deliver it to these sort of central command locations. Then they've got the manpower and the woman power to actually deliver. Yes. And, and they've got more staff and more. So I just think, you know, the body works, you know, the, the, the church is the body. Yes. And the head, Jesus Christ, is directing us. Yeah. Some people are living in America or Canada or around the world. They're praying. Yes. And they're giving. Then you in on the North American team are processing that and moving money to us where we can buy the supplies. And then we're magnifying the impact by being able to buy three times, two, three, four times exactly. as much for what people would be just going to do it on their own. Exactly. And then leveraging the other literal, literal hands and feet and vehicles to get the stuff to the point of greatest need as rapidly as possible. And I, Amen. it's taken like, the first week was dealing with the crisis and trying to figure out 
a new logistical structure. We Yes, we've got 20 plus distribution centers, but they were trying to process what are legitimate needs mm -hmm. and triaging what goes first, what do we prioritize? And um, But that's really working. I think in week two, we're seeing the level of, of effectiveness of yes. the process working much better. Well, I we, hope there's not a week three, four, five, six, amen. but I'm sure that there will be. Well, you know, the, the the Joshua Fund has been processing literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to this point, and we know that it's going to go higher into these humanitarian aid situations. And and I just, and we have a very short podcast here today, and unfortunately, we've got to cut it off because Joel, you're you're getting calls to go do radio and other I've television. Got a radio interviews. interview in three minutes. Yes, yeah, I but, know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but Joel, Lynn, this is ahead. so. <laughs> this is so vital. Yeah. Thank you so much for this mm -hmm. time, uh, and I and I just want to close with our verse of the day. As you've already mentioned it, uh, I know God works in mysterious ways. You didn't have the verse of Matthew twenty five thirty five and to thirty seven. But you, you mentioned it already, and I would just love to say thank you for sharing the stories of, of what God is doing to be hands and feet uh, through uh, you and our, our TJF team. So God bless you guys. Thank you. Thanks. Our verse of the day today is Matthew 25, 35 to 37. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. And I was in prison and you came to visit me. Our prayer requests today are to, number one, pray for TJF volunteers who are providing uh, for those that need it, food, clothing, bedding, toys, diapers, and that those will receive them in Jesus' name and be blessed. And secondly, to pray for the Joshua Fund as we fund trauma counseling in the weeks ahead for those that have been so victimized. Mm -hmm. On behalf of Joel and Lynn Rosenberg in Jerusalem, I want to say thank you for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter. If you'd like more information about how you can help to, to bring hope and healing to this traumatized, uh, war-torn area of Israel right now, you can go to joshuafund.com. And there you can learn about our rapid response fund, about what we're doing in the Middle East, in the epicenter to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus and how you can make a difference in this healing work that we're doing. And as always, if you heard anything on this program that, that you'd like more information on, please check out our show notes. They're included in every one of our broadcasts. For Joel and Lynn Rosenberg, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter.